Welcome back to our intermediate financial accounting class. In our last segment, we started the discussion of earnings per share. We talked about a lot of conceptual basics, what earnings per share is, why it's important, how FASB requires we report it, what the basic equation is. We talked about that just briefly. And then we talked about the difference between basic and diluted earnings per share. Basic, of course, being what we normally think of as EPS, diluted being a worst case scenario. What if everybody who could get our shares of stock did right now? How would that drop our ownership percentage? And, and comparing basic to diluted earnings per share becomes an important analysis for a lot of investors. Now that we've talked about the concepts though, it's time to jump into the calculations. And we're gonna start by doing an example of basic earnings per share without the simplification. So let's take a look at our steps. We're gonna start by calculating our total preferred stock dividends for the year. And remember, preferred stock has no ownership or control of our company. All they get is the right to their dividend first, and if we choose to liquidate our company, they get their portion of the company before the common shareholders do. That's what makes them preferred. But since they can't vote, they're not considered true owners of the business. They don't have any real control. So we're gonna take them out of our calculations. Now we talked about the difference between the types of preferred stock when we talked about chapter 15. But if it's been a while since you've seen that lecture, let me give a really quick refresher. When you issue a preferred stock, you have two options when you do it. And that is, you're know, gonna make it cumulative or non-cumulative. If it's cumulative, then our preferred stockholders are guaranteed their dividend. So let's say we have 100,000 shares of preferred stock and they're supposed to get a $10,000 dividend every single year. If I miss a year, then in the next year, I have to still go back and pay the $10,000 that I missed. If I missed two years, I'd end up paying $30,000. Two years that I missed, plus the current year's dividend, before I can pay any dividends to my common stockholders. That's if my preferred stock is cumulative. If it's non-cumulative, they don't get that right. So if I miss this year, and you don't get your $10,000 the next year, tough. You'll get the $10,000 for next year, but you don't get to go back and get the money that you missed. So when we're doing our earnings per share calculation, we want to know the actual amount we owe to our preferred shareholders. If it's cumulative, then that means the current year's number plus any years we've missed. If it's non-cumulative, then it's just the actual payment that we have made this year. And that's our first step. So we can take out what we owe to those preferred stockholders. Step two, we're going to take the net income number that we've already got reported in our income statement. We're going to subtract out that total preferred stock dividend from step one. And that's going to give us our numerator for our earnings per share calculation. Step three is to calculate the weighted average common stock shares outstanding. And there's several pieces to that calculation. So we're going to talk about it more in a minute, but just be aware it's more than that beginning and ending divided by two. Finally, once we have that weighted average common stock shares outstanding number, we take the numerator from step two, we divide by the weighted average from step three, and that's our earnings per share, carefully rounded, remember, to the nearest penny, because that's gap. Now, most of this we've done. We've done step one, step two, and step four in the past. What we haven't done is step three. So let's look at FASB's real requirements and rules for calculating the weighted average common stock shares outstanding. And there are several parts to this. We'll walk through them conceptually, then we'll do an example, and hopefully it will make more sense at that point. Step number one is to go through the year and figure out when the number of shares outstanding changed. Now, just in case you haven't looked at the equity chapter for a while, there are three numbers that go along with our common stock shares, well, and preferred stock shares as well. First is authorized. When we created our company, we filled out a bunch of legal paperwork, and as part of that paperwork, we asked for permission to issue a certain number of shares. And the government granted permission for us to issue a million, two million, 10 million, whatever it is, shares. Those are the shares that are authorized. They haven't been given to any owners yet, but we have them and we can sell them as we need to get investors. Number two are the shares that have been issued. These are the shares from that set of authorized shares that we have sold to investors at some point. The last number are the shares that are outstanding. That's the number of issued shares that are still held by our owners. You see, the problem is that if you 
issue a share and then you buy it back. You give the investor back their money and they give you back their share of stock and they're not owners anymore. You have two options. You can retire the share and make it as if it was never issued in the first place. So it doesn't even show up as an issued share. Or you can hold it as treasury stock. And later on, if you need more money, you can issue treasury stock. Most companies don't use that first option. They don't want to retire the shares. Why? Because it's a pain in the neck to do a seasoned equity offering. That's where you petition the SEC for permission to issue a bunch of shares that have never been issued before. So I have 10 million shares that are authorized for my company. I have issued a million of them. I would like to issue another million so that I can expand overseas. I have to petition and fill out a bunch of paperwork and have a bunch of things checked. So the SEC will give me permission to sell that next million shares. That's hard. If on the other hand, I have a million shares that I have issued and then I bought back 10,000 shares and I've held them as treasury stock and I decide, you know what, I would like to go ahead and get some more money. I can just issue those treasury shares and sell them again. I don't have to petition for a season equity offering. I just fill out a simple form telling the SEC, hey, I've been owning these treasury shares for about six months. I'm going to sell some of them now. And I just have to inform them. I don't petition. It's not as big a process. It's much easier. Because of that, most companies will hold any shares that were issued at one point as treasury stock instead of retiring them. So what you'll often see are all three numbers on the balance sheet. You'll have the number of shares authorized, 10 million. You'll have the number of shares issued, 1 million. And you'll have the number still outstanding. 990,000. And when you see that as an investor, you say, oh, let's see, they've sold a million. They've got 990 still out there. They must have 10,000 as treasury stock. When we do the earnings per share calculations, this is how we tie this all back in. We're only concerned with shares outstanding, not issued or authorized, just the ones that are outstanding because those are the ones actually being held by my own. Okay, that was a really long aside. It's time to jump back into this calculation. So again, we figured out when the number of shares outstanding changed. Then we figured out how many shares were issued on each of those dates when a change occurred. In step three, if we decide later in the year to issue a stock dividend or a stock split, we make an adjustment to our calculations in step two to account for those stock dividends and stock splits. Why? Well, remember that a stock dividend and a stock split are giving additional shares to people who already own our stock. So they have been our owners all year long. We just granted them extra shares as a stock dividend or as a stock split. If I don't adjust for the fact that they have been owners since the beginning, it's going to skew my weighted average number because it's going to look like I got a bunch of new owners towards the end of the year. And I didn't, they've been owners since the beginning. So that's what that step three is doing. You'll see it better. When we do the calculation. Step four, we figure out the fraction of the year that passed between each change. So from January when I started the year till June 30th when I issued more stock, that would be six months. Then I go from June to the end of August when I decide that I'm going to buy back some shares as treasury stock. So let's see, end of June to the end of August would be July. August would be two months. So that would be two out of 12. And I figure out that time percentage all the way through my year for all of the dates that we figured out in step one. Once we've got all of the numbers, two, three, and four, then I simply multiply. I take the number of shares outstanding, I adjust for any stock splits and dividends, and then I multiply by the fraction of the year that's passed. That gives me my weighted average. And in step six, I sum up all of those products and that gives me my weighted average number of shares outstanding. Now this will make a lot more sense when we actually do an example. So let's jump right in to an example of this. This is TLKS Incorporated. They started off the year with 100,000 shares issued. Of those, 5,000 were held by the company as treasury stock. So right there is our first adjustment. I know my issued was 100,000, but since I own 5,000 of them as treasury stock, my shares outstanding must be 95,000. So that's my first adjustment. I need to make sure I'm using outstanding shares all the way through. During the year, they reported the following changes to the number of common shares that were outstanding. So on March 1st, they issued back out or sold back out 1,000 shares of the treasury stock. 
On April 1st, they declared and issued a 20% stock dividend. On June 1st, they issued 20,000 new shares. On September 1st, they repurchased 2,000 shares. So we have more treasury stock coming in. And then on December 1st, we did a two for one stock split. Using that information, what will be our weighted average common stock shares outstanding for year five? Well, the easiest way to do this is with a table. And it's easiest to do this with five columns. So we need the date of the change. That's step one. We'll get the number of shares outstanding on each date. That's step two. We'll make an adjustment for splits and dividends, stock dividends only. That's step three. Step four is to figure out the fraction of the year that it was outstanding. And finally, step five is gonna give me my weighted average and step six will add up that weighted average column. We start always with January 1, 95,000 shares outstanding. We talked about that already. Then on March 1st, we issued a thousand of our treasury shares. So we resold them. So 95,000 plus 1,000 gives me 96,000 that are now outstanding. This is March 1st. On April 1st, we did a stock dividend, 20%. So let's see, 96,000 times one plus a 20% stock dividend. 96,000 times 1.2 gives me 115,200, and that's my new shares outstanding. Now I'm gonna stop right here and I'm gonna jump to step three, even though we're not quite done with step two yet. Remember that I've issued 20% more shares, but not because I got new owners, but because I gave these previous owners extra shares of stock. If I account for this like it was a stock sale, just adding in this 20% and moving on, then it discounts the ownership and control these people have had since the beginning. So to account for that and to adjust for the fact that these people have been with me since day one, what we do is we adjust up here for this stock dividend amount. So there's that one plus 20% is that 1.2. I don't have to do that in April because I've already incorporated the 20% and it's already grown. So I'm good there. Next, June 1st, I issued 20,000 more shares. So 135,200. And then on September 1st, I purchased back 2,000 shares as treasury stock. So 133,200. And the final change I made on December 1st, I did a two for one stock split. So I take, took those 133,200 shares and I gave everybody an extra share. So 266,400 is going to be my December one number. But again, these people have been with me since the beginning, some of them. Up here, these 95,000. The 135, these people have been with me owning my company since June. I can't just all of a sudden drop their ownership control. So once again, I'm going to adjust for that control since I didn't issue really any new shares. I'm going to adjust all the previous line items for stock splits and stock dividends. With that, we're almost done with step three. I need to do one more thing. Anytime there's more than one adjustment, I'm going to go ahead and do that multiplication first to simplify it later. That gets me done with steps one, two, and three. The next thing I need to do is figure out how long these shares were outstanding between changes. So from January 1 to March 1 is January and February. So these 95,000 shares were outstanding for two out of 12 months. March to April these 96,000 shares were outstanding for one month of the year. April to June, let's see, April, May, so that's two out of 12. June to September is three out of 12. September to December is also three out of 12. And December 1 to December 31 is one out of 12. Now, this is really straightforward. I could just do it by months. You'll sometimes have to do it by half months. So January 1 to March 15 would be two and a half months. Some companies, if they're doing a lot of trading of stocks, 
they have to do it daily or weekly. And for our examples, we're going to keep it to simply monthly or maybe half months. That's as far as we're going to go. But be aware that companies can break this down all the way down to days if they need to. We might have to do some rounding or do we decide, is this a half a month? Is that a half a month? Please make sure as a check for yourself that you always add this up. So two plus one plus two plus three plus three plus one, that does come out to my 12 twelves, and I'm good. But I wanna do that check and make sure. That takes care of step four. Last thing I need to do then is get that weighted average, which is what we're looking for. And to do that, I'm gonna multiply these three columns. So 95,000 times the 2.4 times two twelves, 38,000, 96, times the 2.4 times 112 is 19,200, 38, 4, 67, 6, 66, 600, and finally 22,200. Those are my weighted averages. Step five, last step is to add all of these up 252,000 shares. And that is my real weighted average shares outstanding. Now I know we've gone kind of long, long in this segment, but there is one more thing we need to look at. And it's actually one of our key concepts. So we need to take time to do this. And that is, is this really a big deal doing this whole weighted average calculation? I mean, look at all of the work that's involved here. Can't we just take beginning plus ending and divide by two? Well, let's take a look. We'll go ahead and use that simplified method and see how it comes out. So let's see, my beginning was 95,000, ending 266, 400, and we'll divide by two. And if you do that calculation, you get 180,700 shares. So here's our simplification number. There's our actual weighted average based on true weighting and the times things were issued and FASB's rules. And the answer is yes, it matters. We have to do the real weighted average method if we're going to get an accurate reflection of the ownership of our business. We've gone through a lot of conceptual stuff. We've done one of the funnest examples and calculations out there. I actually remember doing a problem like this on one of my first intermediate two tests way back when I was in school. I remember vividly sitting in the testing center getting through a whole page of these calculations and realizing I had made a mistake on line two. And the memory I have is sitting there with an eraser pencil. I don't know if you even remember those. In erasing a page of calculations so that I could get back to the second line and start all over again and do it the right way. So again, this is a big issue. It's important. It's something that you know you learn through pain, I guess. At least that's how I did. Hopefully you will learn it a lot more easily, but it's an important thing to, to keep track of. And it's also important to realize, yes, this weighted average method, the real weighted average method really is different from that easy method we were using. With that, we're going to stop here. When we come back, we'll start doing our actual earnings per share calculation. We'll see you then. Thanks.